And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. And so, I began to, to realize that it really became clear to me that the only way for us to ever become Christ-like and not be proud of it is to realize that only the Holy Spirit can produce in us what he wants and it's he that is doing it and not us. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every child whom he receives. It literally is, it is because of discipline that you endure. In other words, if God didn't discipline us, we wouldn't make it. God uses discipline to steer us to where we need to go. And if, you see, many people think, if I'm walking in fellowship, nothing's ever bad or going to happen to me. Well, if you're walking in fellowship, God will allow some things into your life to prune some things out of your life. But if you're walking with him and trusting him, you know that he works all things together for good for those who love him. And so you're not driven into despair. You just realize he loves me. And he's a loving father and he wants to guide me to the life that's going to be most meaningful and going to make me the happiest. And, uh, you know, we all take the bit in our teeth and go charging off. Well, I got to have that guy right there. That's the one I love, Lord. And just get out of my way. Or I've got to have that gal out there. Get out of my way. I'm, you know. Well, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. <laughs> Sometimes you hear him, oh, God, why did you let me have this guy? <laughs> um, but it's whom he loves, and it's because of discipline that we, in, that we endure, that we're able to keep going. You see, we, we don't know all the things that we need to know. We grow in knowledge of the word of God. And thank God, he deals with each one of us on the level of maturity we have at that moment. You know that? Because, you see, as you're, as you're just abiding in the vine, he's going to keep growing you as, at his pace. But there's a great difference between a spiritual gift and being filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has three distinct different areas of ministry in us since the day of Pentecost. Every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. And the Holy Spirit uh, does certain things to us the moment we're saved that are once and for all. For instance, we're born again. You never need to be born again. You're taken and baptized into union with the very person of Christ and made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. That doesn't have to be done but once. He comes to take a permanent dwelling inside of us. He never leaves. That's done once. And then at the same time, just like a baby is born with certain talents, you know, you inherit certain aptitudes and talents, even from your parents and the genes you inherit. Well, you don't know what those talents are until you grow up to where you can develop and you can realize, well, I got a certain knack for this, as we call it. In the same way, in the, in the Christian life, dwelling in the vine, the moment you were born again, you were given certain spiritual gifts. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit distributes to each one sovereignly as he wills, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Distributing gifts as he wills. 
Now, you don't know what your spiritual gifts are until later when you begin to grow spiritually, and all of a sudden there will be certain abilities that will come out that you didn't realize you ever had before. I mean, for me to have done two things is, is a miracle upon miracles because before I was a Christian, I was so terrified to get up in front of in any group to speak that I'd get completely tongue-tied. And I couldn't teach Mary had a little lamb. And yet, as I began to grow in Christ, this just, at first it was a passion. I wanted to do it. And I began to grow in communicating. Now, the degree of how good I am, that's up to God, not to me. Because it's a gift. And also, there, was, there is another ministry of the Holy Spirit. Only this is not something that is given to you at once. It's the filling of the Spirit, which is like the sap flowing from the vine into the branch to empower and give life to that. It happens progressively as you consciously will to be in that living relationship with the vine. You understand that? So, the at any given time, I'm either filled with the Holy Spirit or I'm not. If I consciously sin, that moment I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. I can confess my sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. In other words, if I confess what I don't know, God forgives. Uh, I'm sorry, if I confess what I know, you can't confess what you don't know. Because you have to confess it specifically. And you can't say like I used to hear in prayer. And, and forgive us all our sins at last. You ever heard that? Well, if he didn't forgive you at the first, he's not going to forgive you at the last. <laughs> he doesn't want it. That doesn't mean anything to him. God wants you, to, if you screwed up, God, no, I don't say that, I say Father, look at that, Father, it wasn't just a little white lie, it was a lie, and I agree with you that it's sin. Thank you that in Jesus Christ I was forgiven when I accepted him. So you see, in the Christian life, you don't have to beg God to forgive you. You're already forgiven. You just claim it when you are willing to acknowledge it and call it what God calls it and then depend on the Holy Spirit to take you out of it. I hope this is beginning to gel, okay, because, you know, the Christian life is so misunderstood. Uh, the problem, and I don't want to criticize anybody. Everybody's well-meaning if they're trying to teach things. But the Bible is, is, is something that's very explicit about the way we live for God. For instance, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit have we all been baptized into one body, whether Greek or Jew, or Jew or Greek, bond or slave, and we've all been made to drink of one Spirit. And if somebody says, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. You've been saved. And that was one of the five once and for all things that the Holy Spirit does for every believer at the moment you accept Christ. He takes you and puts you into living, inseparable union with the person of Christ himself. You become bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, a member of his body. However, if you want to live, if you want the power to live the Christian life, then you've got to claim the filling of the Holy Spirit. That is what the Holy Spirit outlines. Now, let's go on here for a moment. I really chased a lot of rabbits on that one, but uh, those are necessary. Uh, so one of the most beautiful things here is that uh, 
the Father is the ultimate gardener. God the Father looks over the whole process and guides it. He brings discipline when it's needed. Jesus is the life. As long as we as a branch are joined to him, we partake of his life. The Holy Spirit carries his life into us as we're joined to him. And the beautiful thing is that uh, we keep uh, we keep in this continuing process by the power of God. Now a fourth observation on this allegory. Vines have one basic purpose. Study them. Vines have one basic purpose. And that's to bear fruit. If you try to build a house out of vine wood, it's not going to be very good. It's not going to last long either. And furniture out of vine wood is no good either. In other words, what's a vine for? The wood's no good. It's for one thing, to bear fruit. And that's part of what I think the Holy Spirit wants us to know. We're, when we think about bearing, uh, abiding in Christ as a branch in the vine, it's for one purpose, to produce fruit. All right, a fifth observation. What is the fruit? It talks about bearing much fruit. What is it? Hold your place. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity or an excuse for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in this statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's why we're not under the law of Moses, because now the Holy Spirit dwells in every believer. And for the first time, we're able, through the sap running from the vine into the branch, to love the way God loves. And uh, so it says, love does no evil to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, it goes on. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. See, that's someone who's not abiding in the vine. He's a believer, but not abiding in the vine. Verse 16. But I say, keep on walking by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now notice, if you walk in the Spirit, does it say you will not have less the flesh? No, it says you won't carry them out. This is a way that Satan can trip you up. I remember when I first was learning how to depend upon the Holy Spirit and to, you know, walk in him, and I began to see some things really happening in my life, and I was so excited. And uh, I remember that I was in a prayer meeting, and all of a sudden, my eye caught something, and all of a sudden, the old flesh reared up, and I said, oh, my God, how could I think that? You see, I, I was trying to apologize to God that my spiritual slip was showing. And I finally had to learn from the Lord. It's not a sin to be tempted. You've got an old sin nature that's still there, and that old sin nature is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Most Christians are trying to improve the old sin nature. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. So it's not a sin to be tempted. When it becomes sin is when you allow it to take root in your mind. When you are tempted, you are to say in your mind, no. Then turn to the Lord and say, 
you lead me, I mean, just this attitude, you lead me to myself, I'm gone. But I'm depending on you to put this temptation down. It's like the old story of the uh, the uh, charlatan that came into a village in India and said, I have a absolute foolproof formula for how to turn these rocks into gold. So everybody got excited, and man, they were, uh, they all wanted to get together and raise some money to buy this formula and everything, and he was demonstrating how to work, and he, he's, he slipped in stealthily some gold, and oh, there's gold, you know, and so, uh, and so he collected the money, and then as he was about to leave, he said, now, just remember this, this formula will always work as long as you don't think about a red-faced monkey. <laughs> you ever tried to not think about a red-faced monkey if you thought that was a thing? Because even in trying to deal with it, you were thinking about it. You see, the sin nature and the world system is so strong that it, the more you try to deal with it, the more it becomes an issue in your life. All God left in our responsibility to walk with him is the choice, the choice to abide in the mind, to say no to temptation and to abide in the mind and let the Lord fight the battle. And he will. All right, now read on. So he says, for the flesh or the sin nature sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things you please or you really want to do. So he's telling us right there, there is a civil war that goes inside of each one of us. And you may not have noted it before you were a Christian, but I'll guarantee you after you're a Christian, that's a sure sign you've been born again. If you see this big civil war going on inside and you, you know, that your new nature wants to follow the will of God and the old nature wants to take you the other way and boy, these two are fighting like crazy inside of you so that you're not able to do what you want to do. And then the law comes along. The law of God. And it comes along and it says, thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not lust. So you start trying not to lust. Well, you're looking at a red-faced monkey. <laughs> In verse 18 it says, but if you are being led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see... The minute you start trying to keep the law, the more your old nature rebels and wants to do the very thing it's commanded not to do. And yet, if you say no to it and then in faith turn to the Lord and just depend upon him, he will give you victory. Each one of us has areas of weakness, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, honky-tonking, uh, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who keep practicing such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This means if you just habitually earn it, you never break it. It means you never got it in the first place. But, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And that's what abiding in the vine is designed to do, to produce that. And of course, as the Holy Spirit is producing this fruit in you, it empowers you.
to then reach out and express those beautiful attributes in helping people, bringing people to faith in Christ. It, the Holy Spirit will enable you to be good at what God has gifted you to do. He'll make it really powerful. You know, it's just like, if you want one of the most beautiful examples of the power of, of a spiritual gift, I bet you that Billy Graham has a gift of evangelism like few men in history. God determined how great it would be. And you know, I bet you Billy Graham could get up and recite, Mary had a little lamb, and get an invitation and thousands would come to Christ. Because that's his gift. I mean, it, it, I've heard him give the gospel in a very poor way. And, and, and I mean by that, not, not really doctrinally on the target sometimes. And, uh, sometimes it was just very simple and not really to the point. But people would come to Christ because that's his gift. And God is going to operate that gift no matter what. John chapter 15 again, verse six. If anyone does not abide in me, in this present tense, if anyone keeps not abiding in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and they cast them into fire and they're burned. Now I've heard preachers get up and talk about this one and say, you see, if you don't live for Christ, you're going to burn in hell. Now let me ask you, this allegory said you're a branch. Now look at your arm. Do you see any bark there? You see what I mean? This is an allegory. But the minute you get to fire, they forget this is an allegory. Fire doesn't mean hell. Fire is judgment. Discipline. Because you see, if you just keep on habitually refusing to abide in Christ so that you can be used to produce fruit, you finally lose the place and the privilege of fruit bearing. So what this is talking about is loss of the place of being a fruit bearer. And you know, there's nothing sadder than a Christian who's been Christian for years and years and years. And they just don't take the chance to avail themselves of the wonderful gifts and the power that God has given us. They never really produce any fruit. And what happens? They're taken out of the vine. They dry up and wither. I've known Christians who... Uh, get up in years and they become bitter, bitter about life. Life doesn't count for much. Now they're still saved, but they're not accounting for anything. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, let me show you about that. Turn to First Corinthians. We'll close with this. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 11, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, the foundation in this illustration counts. It, it is your salvation. When you're saved, you're put on the one foundation, and that's Jesus Christ, okay? If any man builds upon the foundation, once you're a believer in Christ, if you build upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, that's one category. The other, wood, hay, straw. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with what? Fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon the foundation remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. But what? He himself shall be saved. Yet so as through fire. So you see, that's the meaning of, in what uh, sense it's used in John 15, verse 6. Uh, 
our works that we have done as a Christian are going to be tested at the judgment seat of Christ. And gold, silver, and precious stones will be everything you had produced in you through depending on the, on the Christ and the Holy Spirit. Everything that by faith is produced in you by the Holy Spirit is gold, silver, and precious stones. And the fire won't touch it. But everything that you did by your, by, with the wrong motives, with uh, uh, trying to do it yourself, even with good motives, trying to do things by your own power, it doesn't count. Wood, hay, and stubble. Will all be burned up. So my prayer for all of us is that when we get there and I see you, we don't smell like smoke. John chapter 16. I'm going to have to take a running start at this because I wasn't satisfied with what I was rushing on the last part of John 15. So I'm going to start at verse 16 in John chapter 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Here's a great promise of God saying that, you know, we didn't choose God. He chose us. And with each one he chooses, he offers to give you all that you need to bear fruit and to bring others to know Jesus as Savior. And in the course of that, he gives you the promise that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And he goes on, this I command you, that you love one another. And this is reinforcing something he said in verse 12 of John 15, where he said, this is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. See, this is the new commandment. Jesus says, keep my commandments, this is it. To love one another as he loved, as he loves us is the new commandment that took the place of the Ten Commandments. Because he is about to announce the new ministries of the Holy Spirit that will give the kind of life and power inside to truly love people with divine love. And if you love people that way, you don't have to have a bunch of laws telling you what not to do to them. In verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now, in chapter 7, verse 7 of the Gospel of John, he said why the world hates us, basically. It says in chapter 7, verse 7, The world cannot hate you, in and of yourself, that's the idea. But it hates, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. You see, when somebody hates you because you're a Christian, don't take it personal. If you're a believer, especially if you expose the fact that you're a believer in Jesus Christ to any degree, the world, the world system, this organized atmosphere and system that is in this world we live in is under the control of Satan. And once you're jerked out of that system by faith in Christ, don't be surprised if the world hates you. But it's not really you. It's Jesus who lives in you that hates. And why does it hate Jesus? Because he testifies that the deeds of this world system are evil. Going on, verse 19. If you were of the world, and getting back to how important it is to recognize the uh, what kind of a conditional clause this is, this is a 
second class conditional clause in the original Greek, which means if and you are not of this world system, if you were of this world system and emphatically you are not, the world would love its own. See, if you're part of this world system, and, you know, some Christians uh, don't give enough evidence to be proven guilty in court that they're Christian. But even so, God says you're not of this world, and Satan says, amen, that that person over there is not a very good Christian, but he's, he doesn't belong to me anymore, or she doesn't belong to me anymore. Jesus Christ jerked that person out of my system. So he spends the rest of his time with his minions to try to keep you silent and not, not give too much exposure that you're a Christian. So he says, but because you are not ek, the preposition in Greek is ek as it is all the way through here, because you're not out of this world system, but I chose you out of the world system. Because of this, the world continually hates you. Now, it's interesting that it says about every Christian now that you are not of this world system. In other words, you were. But you see, what this is showing is that what Jesus did the moment you received him as your Savior and accepted the gift of pardon, he died in your place to buy for you and provide for you. Because that has happened and at the point that happened, you were so removed out of the world system that he can say you're no longer out of it. You're out of a new world order, that of God's forever family. All right, going on to verse 20. Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, what class condition you think that is? First class, right? If and they do, or they did persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, first class condition, and they did, they will keep yours also. In other words, here is encouragement that as we go representing Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, then as we give out the word of God, people are going to uh, listen to it and abide by it and keep it. And that's good to know. Because, uh, you know, it can get very discouraging when you're teaching the Word of God and you see people tool off and, and they disregard it for a while. And uh, yet, the, the Word is planted and God said, My Word will not return unto me void. And uh, He will make His servant stand. The most important thing is that you know the Holy Spirit dwells in you. From the moment you believed in Christ, he took a permanent residence in you. And the Holy Spirit is going to keep on working in you to seek to bring you to maturity. And so the most important thing is, is that you feed yourself with the word and that you take opportunities to be taught the word as often as possible because Holy Spirit's going to take the word of God and he's going to keep working in your new nature that he caused to be born in you, a new spiritual nature, and keep making that nature to grow. And the more it grows, the more it will dominate your life. Verse 21, But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. So in the first statement here, he says, 
the words that he spoke to us, they are reason enough for people to be brought to be responsible. And if it's turned down, they're responsible. Verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. Now there is a very interesting verse. This is another one of those subtle ways that you find in the Gospel of John where Jesus claimed to be equal with God the Father. Because unless he is saying they hate me in the same way and for the same reason, they hate God the Father. So this is just a reverse way of saying what he said in John 10 verse 30 where he said, I and the Father are one. Literally, I and the Father are one essence. So he's claiming absolute deity by saying they hate me in the same way and for the same reason they hate my father. And that hatred is getting very great. If Jesus delays his com coming, I believe there's going to be a lot of physical persecution of Christians. Because I see that hatred really growing in the United States. And then in verse 24, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. Wow. It's interesting that the verbs used here, but now they have seen and have hated. Those two verbs are in the perfect tense which means they saw in the past with results that they keep on not seeing. They hated at a point of time in the past so that they keep on hating. These indicate a deliberate choice that's made in the past that just keeps on going and, and uh, continuing in its impact. To me, I, I don't know whether it gets through to you or not, but to me that's that's so sad and frightening that a person can reach a place where they make a choice that can, that it will not be reversed. It just keeps on getting worse. In verse 25, but they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. You know, Matthew chapter 23, verse 38, Luke chapter 13, verse 35, and Acts chapter 1, verse 20, mention this prophecy. It comes from Psalm 69. It also comes from uh, Psalm 35, verse 19. It's a prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus. And he says it, it's being fulfilled by the way these people were rejecting him. They hated me without cause, and it fulfills what was predicted about especially that generation. And uh, it's interesting that in the original Greek, the word without cause is the Greek word dorian, D-O-R-E-A-N, dorian. In Greek, that means something that is completely free of cause. Something that's completely free of cause. It's often used to, to say, like if you give someone a gift, you say it is a Dorian. In other words, it's being given for no cause of worthiness in the one that's receiving the gift. Let me read you, read from Psalm 35, verse 19. These are messianic predictions in Psalms, or many of them. Do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me, nor let those who hate me without cause wink maliciously. And then chapter, uh, Psalm 69, verse 4, Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are powerful, being wrongfully my enemies. What I did not steal, I then have to restore. In Psalm 69, verse 9, for instance, let me show you a few of the things that are 
definitely prophecies about what would happen to Jesus as the Messiah. Psalm 69, verse 9, it says, For the zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now, John chapter 2, verse 7 applies that to what Jesus did when he went to the temple and found the uh, money changers, you know, the Federal Reserve of that day, in there robbing the people. And uh, they had a very clever system. It, it, you, uh, if you brought a lamb, it had to be according to their opinion, without blemish. So, you know, if someone came to offer a lamb uh, on the Day of Atonement, uh, they would come with all their heart wanting to worship God and do what the Lord had said. And guess what? The priest craft would uh, never pass a lamb you brought. You had to buy one of theirs. And they wouldn't accept any currency but the special temple currency. So when you traded your money in, you would get robbed. I mean, you would have to pay this big difference in currency. The priesthood, by the time Jesus came, was a bunch of gangsters. Jesus was a carpenter. And you didn't have a lumber yard where he could go down and buy finished lumber. He had to cut it down himself, split it, plane it, and everything else. Now, do you think a weak man could do that? Furthermore, Jesus was born without the original sin. So there was the impact of sin on his physical being was not there. So he would have had to be a very, very strong person physically as a human being. And he shows it because he storms into that temple and he picks up those guys by the seat of their toga and throws them out. He runs through there like a wild man, turning over all of their money changing tables. And he drives the sheep and stuff out of there. He said, don't make my father's house a place of merchandise. And you know what? No one tried to arrest him. In Psalm 69, verse 21, it says, They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Look at John 19. 28 through 30 for a moment. After these things, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, I am, uh, that might be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, Tetelestai! Paid in full. But you know something? It's just, it's just amazing. See, that was a prophecy that had to be fulfilled. Jesus knew everything else had been fulfilled except that one little prophecy had not been fulfilled yet. So he said, I thirst knowing what they would do. And they hand him sour wine. Can you imagine what that would do to a parched throat that was bone dry and cracking? It was the final great insult and pain. And as soon as he fulfilled that prophecy by taking a taste of it, he shouted out, Paid in full. And what he meant by that is everything that was needed to pay for your sins and mine had been paid in full. That was his sixth statement on the cross. His seventh, he calmly bowed his head and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
and of his own will he died. As Jesus said in John, I lay my, my life down of myself. No man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. They couldn't kill him. He had to willingly die. And that shows you the high regard Jesus had for the literal interpretation of prophecy, doesn't it? This is the beginning of serious promises about the Holy Spirit's new ministry in verse 26. And in, in this section, Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit will be the inspiration and teacher of all truth. John fifteen twenty six. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. He says, when the Helper comes. This is, uh, in the Greek, the, the word paraclete, parakletos. A paraclete was one who was called alongside to always be a helper. That's the first meaning. Secondly, a paraclete was an intercessor. So he's saying the Holy Spirit's going to come and he is going to be your constant helper. It also meant that he is going to be your constant intercessor. As it says in Romans 8, he prays for us with words too deep or with, with, he prays for us with thoughts too deep for words. I don't know whether you've ever been in a situation like this. I, I have many times. I have been in situations where God allowed such, uh, stress and, and, and uh, such testing that I would become speechless. And I would be in prayer. I couldn't even pray. And it was at those times I would feel deep inside of me prayer going up to God through me. And I would just keep on my knees because I knew though I couldn't express what I needed, the Holy Spirit was. You ever been through that? Oh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Because even in the heat of the greatest testing, the Holy Spirit is that one that's our paraclete. He's interceding for us. This word is also used as an advocate, attorney. He is our defense attorney. And all this word contains all of those meanings. He comes along to help us in everything. He comes along to intercede for us. And he comes to be our defense attorney. When it says, when the helper comes whom I will send you from my father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the father, he will testify about me. The spirit of truth. You know, the Holy Spirit is, is described by a genitive of, of uh, character in many, many places. Like I'll say, he's the, he's the spirit of truth, the spirit of fear of the Lord, and so on. Well, what does that mean? That is describing some attribute and some uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit that he has toward us. So this is the Holy Spirit when he says the spirit of truth. But he's speaking about the spirit of truth, meaning the spirit who will make the truth real to you. The spirit who is the source of truth. The spirit who is the one who will inspire the truth. Everyone who wrote the word of God, wrote in the New Testament or wherever, the Holy Spirit was the one who communicated the truth into this person's personality and his experience and superintended that knowledge so that it was reduced to writing in the very words that God wanted said. That's what we call inspiration scripture. And so you ask me, do you believe the Bible is the word of God in every word? 
I believe the Bible is the word of God to, down to the tense, the voice, the mood of the verbs, the declension of the nouns, the adjectives. Everything about it is the word of God. All scripture is God breathed, Second Timothy 3.16 says. And uh, that's why we can trust it. That's why we can stake our not only our life here, but eternity on it. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any machaira, a two-edged sword. Piercing even to dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, and as a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, when you take in the word of God, you're taking something living into you. And it can discern your thoughts. It can discern, it can discern what nothing else can do between your soul and your spirit. That's amazing, isn't it? Your soul is that part of you that is, uh, physical life and can relate to this physical world. The spirit is that which knows and can relate to God on a personal level. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, can distinguish between what is of the soul and what is of the spirit. God bless you, your patient audience. It's uh, This is, I realize as we are in the upper room that we're getting into a little bit more heavy doctrine, but I hope it's not too heavy for you, or I hope you can relate to it because it's so important to know. God bless you. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned.